At the end of June, my producer Sarah and I flew to Texas. I nearly missed the flight. We landed late, the car rental pickup took well over an hour, and this meant by the time we were finally driving east out of Dallas, we were running behind schedule. Along the way, we stopped at a Bucky's so I could change out of my plain clothes and into something more presentable. Sarah, smartly, got a sandwich. I got another cup of coffee, and we kept driving. We were on our way to Longview, Texas, an old oil town about two and a half hours outside of Dallas. Sarah helped me navigate and prep for our interview, while I tried to get comfortable with the fact that the going speed seems to be 85 miles per hour. Oh, and it was well over 100 degrees. As we pulled off the highway and wound through the streets of Longview, we finally caught sight of the derelict strip mall we'd come all this way to find. Oh my God, that's his bright yellow car. And it's like that, like, banana cream color. All right, here totally. we go. Okay. The unmarked door was on the side of the building. We yanked it open and were immediately facing a staircase with an American flag at the top. The door at the top of the steps had a little paper sign that said, Educational Research Analysts. Oh. Hi. Hi. Hey. I'm Grace. You're Grace. Yes. I'm Judy. Judy, it's I'm lovely Sarah. to meet you. Sarah. Hi. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Thank you so much for taking the time to talk with us today. Oh, you're welcome. Let me get um, give some cold water. <laughs> oh, I appreciate it. Educational Research Analysts is the textbook review organization founded by Mel and Norma Gabler. As we entered we were confronted with more thick, hot air. There was no AC in this office, nor were there any windows. Instead, we were immediately absorbed into wall-to-wall dark wood paneling, orange carpet, and fluorescent lighting. It was a little like going back in time. Thank you so much. You are welcome. Oh, thank you. We're sorry to make you exist in this kind of place. <laughs> no, it's, oh, no, no, it's you're good. good. Our delight. Yeah. Judy Fry grabbed us each a bottle of water from a small break room where her son sat on an old desktop computer, looking at what I imagine was a textbook on his screen. He didn't turn to acknowledge us at any point. And that's not because there was a lot going on or that there was a constant flood of people in and out of this place. It felt deserted, obscure, and just about as unlikely as the Gabler's whole story itself. And then, the man we'd come to see rounded the corner. Dressed in a sharp button-down shirt, cufflinks, and thick black-rimmed glasses, with eyebrows that stuck several inches off his face, pushing a walker, was Neil Fry, the ascetic textbook analyst. From Wonder Media Network, I'm Grace Lynch, and this is Teaching Texas, Episode 3. Our interview with Neil got off to a weird start. We followed Judy to the end of a long hallway to Neil's office. The room was full of several fans blasting at full volume, completely ruining our audio recording. I sat there panicked, fearing we'd walk away from this journey without any usable tape. Judy settled into a seat against the wall perpendicular to Neil's desk. She'd sit there pretty silently, for the duration of our stay. Neil shuffled into the room, and without giving us a second to insert ourselves, started rustling through papers on his desk, talking a mile a minute. His speech style is a bit of an audio producer's nightmare. He mumbles, mostly, then suddenly shouts, cackles, and goes back to mumbling. And then, as if the room needed one more element of chaos, the fluorescent lights started flickering overhead. It was like a high school theater production trying to infuse a scene with drama. It was that over the top and absurd. After about 20 minutes of this insanity, miraculously, the room short-circuited. The main fans stopped working. Only a weak one in the hall remained. Suddenly... I could hear Neil, and he started letting me ask questions. As the most loyal of the Gabler's disciples, I was keen to know what Neil thought of them. Gabler's were not highly educated, but they were very astute, smart, natively intelligent people. (coughs) 
they always thought that education would have ruined them. <laughs> and that might be true if they all the way to education, but they were very, very astute. We always, we were philosophically always compatible. Unlike the Gablers, Neil graduated from college. He has a master's degree and pursued a PhD for a time, but didn't complete it. He taught at the college level for several years before a mentor connected him with the Gablers. Still, Neil and the Gablers were ideologically compatible. Their work ethic was on par, too. I'm, I'm a detail fanatic, hyper-perfectionist. How are you going to gain their respect? One way. Prove several times that you have, you have mastered detail, mastered the detail both of the textbook approval process and of textual content, as well as or better than they have. And once you prove that two or three times, and it's an airtight case, they'll back off and respect you. But if you make it, it's better, it's better not to cite one, not to cite ten factors, and to cite nine right ones and have one wrong one, because they'll crucify you if they find one thing wrong. They'll crucify you, and you've lost your credibility. It's a, it's a, it's a very deadly process to be a Christian conservative in these, in these secular liberal circles. It's worth taking a second to note that Neil's a detail fanatic about all sorts of things, not just textbooks. Neil fasts five days out of the week. Monday through Friday. No food. Water, yeah, but nothing else. Saturday, he eats 40 prunes. That's four zero prunes. And then eats normally for the rest of Saturday and Sunday. Mondays, he said, are typically for rest. It's also the day the Holy Spirit speaks to him. Neil graciously made an exception for us and took our meeting on a Monday. Neil does this extreme form of fasting because he believes it stimulates stem cell regeneration and will reverse the aging process. He intends to live to be 126. He's currently 78. While that would be reason enough to try and interview him, the reason we drove to this oven of an office is because Neil represents the last vestige of the Gabler's enterprise. And lucky for us, he was ready to talk about it. I will say this on the factual errors. Gabriel's never said they found those factual errors. The publishers knew where they were coming from, but a lot of the, a lot of the public thought that Mel and Norma Gabriel sitting at the kitchen table found these factual errors, and that is laughable. Gabriel's never said they found them. Our organization found them, but I was perfectly happy. I mean, to let them get the credit for it. Uh, I, I never envied them at all. Judy will tell you that. In fact, I thought it was sort of humorous. Because some people who should have known better thought that Gabriels were finding the factual errors themselves. I've never told anybody else this. And like I say, we were always we were always so compatible. We always got along really well together. I never I never never begrudged never begrudged them getting credit for it. I liked them. Uh, it helped the organization. Uh, but like I say, when publishers would come down here, uh, Mr. Gabriels sit here next to you, but I did all the talking. In all my research into the Gablers, I've never seen Neil given credit for finding the bulk of the errors. We obviously can't ask the Gablers about it themselves. But when I asked Jim about his parents' work, he says he remembers his dad going line by line through the books. But that would have been before Neil joined the team. So this remains unconfirmed. Yet after talking to Neil, I'm inclined to believe it. The Gablers' rise has always been a surreal story trying to figure out how these two people with no higher education would have been able to fact-check textbooks at this level has confounded not only me, but textbook editors and education professionals alike. It would make a whole lot of sense for there to be another player in the story, someone who had a bit more formal training. I think there's a chance Neil was the brains behind the operation. Mel was the visionary, and Norma, the mouthpiece. Neil clearly revered Mel. Norma, however, I got the sense may have rubbed him the wrong way. There are two sides to Norma Gabler. One of them was the gracious side. The other side was the bitchy side. I've seen both sides. Not many people have. I was pretty stunned that Neil called Norma a bitch in front of us. And that depiction is hard to square with her TV persona. Perhaps the two were just oil and water. We know that Norma was outspoken and media savvy. Neil's the total opposite. So unsurprisingly, when age caught up with the Gablers and Neil took over educational research analysts, he took a different approach. 
Dan Quinn was monitoring the State Board of Education for Texas Freedom Network when Neil took over for the Gablers. He's a little bit quieter. He typically doesn't or didn't show up at state board meetings uh, the way the Gablers did. The Gablers would come and publicly testify, and it was a big deal. Um, Neil stayed in the background. But by the time Neil took over the organization, the religious right faction on the board that had been growing since the early 90s had reached its peak. All Neil had to do was sit down with some of the religious right members of the board in the background and feed them what he wanted them to do. Neil was grandfathered into a system that allowed him to marry Annette from the background, which is what Neil felt the Gabler should have been doing all along. About the only thing we ever disagreed with was, was this. They wanted to motivate the mom and pop to the kitchen table. My viewpoint was, the bottom 90% don't matter. If you reach the 10% elite, the 90% will follow. Now, they didn't buy that. Neil's approach, which relied on influencing those with power rather than mobilizing the people, was an effective pivot for educational research analysts for a couple of reasons. The first is that things had gotten a bit crowded in the public square. In the early days of the textbook hearings the Gablers attended, You could only speak if you were in opposition to the book in question. You could not speak in favor of the book. The reason being, trying to get the list narrowed down to just five was hard. The focus of these meetings was to find reasons to eliminate books. That was the pressing need. That's one of those things that seems pretty innocent on its own, but it's a contributing factor to the Gabler's ability to become so influential. There was only opposition. No balancing viewpoint. It's as if the Gablers were the sole constituency, the only opinion the board ever needed to consider. But in 1983, that rule finally changed. A progressive lobbying group called People for the American Way drafted new language that would remove these restrictions on who could testify at public hearings. After years of campaigning, the board relented. People for the American Way represented the first meaningful opposition to the Gablers. While their balancing voice slowed the Gablers down, it certainly didn't stop them. Plenty of their biggest moments, many of which we covered in our last episode, happened well after People for the American Way was established. Then, in the mid-90s, another balancing force arrived on the scene, Texas Freedom Network. Here's Carissa Lopez, their current senior political director. We were founded in 1995 by Cecile Richards when she was at a State Board of Education meeting. They were talking about health textbooks, and she wrote a note to her friend that said, it's worse than I imagined, and then she founded TFN. Texas Freedom Network saw a huge issue with the State Board of Education. Aside from a group of highly animated citizens, no one really knew what was going on with the board. And that's a bit by design. In most states, similar boards or groups that deal with school curriculum are appointed positions, so they're not subject to political pressures. But that's not the case in Texas. And these more obscure elected positions don't receive a lot of attention. I had Dan break it down for me. So there's 15 districts. They're elected in partisan elections. So there's 31 Senate districts in the state, but only 15 state board seats. So they're more than twice the size of Senate districts. Some are sprawling over dozens and dozens of counties. They're so large that to be able to communicate with voters during an election would just cost an enormous amount of money. Most people in Texas, particularly at that time, if they knew there was a state board of education, they weren't sure what it did. They almost certainly didn't know who their state board member was. Enter Texas Freedom Network. Carissa told me this public outreach is really TFN's primary objective. We see our job is to make the public aware of what's happening at the SBOE because oftentimes it is very much overlooked, right? It is a body that a lot of people don't pay attention to. The election might be at the top of somebody's ballot, but they don't know who that person is. It also is kind of by design. The board, is a, the being an SBOE member, is an unpaid position. They have no staff, right? And so it's not a very high-profile position. These positions may not be high-profile, but they are very powerful. Because these members aren't paid, they reasonably cannot dedicate all their time to this work, even if it is incredibly important work. 
so they rely really heavily on advisors they trust, people like Neil. If you remember in our last episode, Dan told us about how in 2004, publishers self-censored their health textbook to avoid any mention of contraception or LGBTQ people. Well, it turns out, the Texas State Board of Education wanted even further revisions, and Neil was behind it. So at the very last meeting, the final adoption, final approval, one of the religious right board members uh, raised objections to how the health textbooks uh, talked about marriage. She said they have all of these asexual stealth phrases, you know, marriage partners, couples. She says it's a man and a woman. These textbooks should make clear that under Texas law, marriage is between a man and a woman. So words like couple and partners were too ambiguous. The board wanted language that specifically excluded LGBTQ people. But then she went further. Textbooks should be talking about homosexuality in this way. Basically, she wanted the, the passages in the textbooks to essentially say gay people, or there's just something wrong with them. They're asocial, they're, they have all of the, they, they're alcoholics, they're drug addicts, they, they're diseased. Uh, and, you know, all of us are sitting in the audience thinking, what in God's name is going on here? At the very last meeting, she brings this up. The Democrats were incensed by this. They were like, how could you possibly bring that up? Where in the world did you get this from? Neil Fry. That board member Dan is referring to is Terry Leo. Neil brought her up a lot during our visit. They're very politically aligned. He also mentioned a large file of documents he'd sent her over the years. This this long file of everything I ever sent Terry. Dan's very familiar with these documents Neil sent Terry. So he had fed her the sheet. We have it or had it on file for many years. We got a copy of the sheet that he had provided. It was vile all the way through. Ultimately, publishers resisted making most of the changes, but they did go back and more explicitly define marriage as a union of one man and one woman. Up to this point, we've really only zeroed in on how the Gablers, and now Neil, affected textbook content and selection. For good reason. That's how this whole thing got started. But there's another lever of control that the board can pull that is just as important, if not more so. The Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills, or TEKS. The State Board of Education is solely responsible for creating curriculum standards in Texas. Carissa Lopez again. There's a lot of players in this, but ultimately, the State Board of Education themselves, the individual board members, can put or remove anything they want in these standards. And then textbook publishers create textbooks based on those standards, right? Back in the 1980s, there was a nationwide movement to create curriculum standards, and Texas was part of that. First, they made what they called the essential elements, which outlined what a child should learn by the end of any given school year. This also made it possible for the state board to approve more textbooks, up from five to eight. The logic was more books would be acceptable if there were stronger standards in general. Then in the late 90s, the process evolved even further. And that's how we arrived at the Teeks. In 1995, when the education code was rewritten under under the leadership of then Senator Bill Ratliff, one of the true legendary... That's David Anderson, our Texas textbook industry aficionado. Texas Essential Knowledge and Skills will tell teachers and parents what students should know and be able to do in any grade or subject or high school course. From there you would build a state assessment that would reflect those standards, build it within the standards. And you would create an instructional materials review process that said, if these are the standards for student learning, this is what we want to see in the books. When Texas passed the Teagues in 97, suddenly there was no limit on the number of textbooks that could be adopted. While that might seem like Texas letting publishers off the hook, David confirmed for me, that it actually had the opposite effect. And I can cite a specific example. One company, the Scott Forsman Company, submitted a a U.S. history book. And in the teacher's edition, they overprinted the state standards. In those days, it was the essential elements that described 
what opportunities a teacher would present the students in that class. So not only are publishers writing their books to meet the Texas standards, they're including guides in the teacher's edition that illustrate just how precisely their book matches the teaks. That kickstarted the industry, uh, basically the cottage industry for correlations in Texas. And that very next year, almost every significant publisher in Texas developed a correlation that showed how their program matched those essential elements. To recap, the Texas State Board of Education creates these curriculum standards called TEKS, and textbook publishers then write their books specifically to meet the TEKS. Their selling point, as David describes, is being able to illustrate their adherence to the Texas standards. So, if you can believe it, the adoption of TEKS made textbook publishers even more hamstrung to delivering Texas-specific materials. Now, the State Board of Education doesn't create these standards from scratch. They have what they call working groups of teachers, community members, and subject matter experts who compile suggested drafts. There's opportunities for public comment, and the two bodies go back and forth making revisions. That is, until the very end of the process, when the board votes to adopt the TEKS. At that point, with no further review or public comment available, board members can, with just a simple majority, make amendments. So that's why the board is so powerful. Because despite the fact that there's no requirement for them to have any background in education, they get to unilaterally change the curriculum standards if they want. So that means publishers care a lot about what these folks have to say. And they care even more about the people who are feeding them those opinions. Uh, a couple of years ago, I'm, I'm now retired Texas sales rep. I know him well. And, and the, the retired editor of a major publisher one of the major publishers, asked they to come visit us in this office. And so they came out from McKinney and wherever the other place was to talk a day. We used to, we used to send that, they used to let us see the pre-publication drafts. And I would hand annotate stuff in the draft that before I went to the press. When Neil told me that people from major publishers were asking for his notes on unpublished drafts of textbooks, I think I kind of blacked out which honestly could have been from the heat and the fact that I'd officially sweat through my pants at that point and was fully merged with the seat itself. I just couldn't imagine publishing Titans driving all the way to this nondescript strip mall and sitting in this room with no windows and no AC to speak not with academics or scholars, but with Neil freaking Fry, a nonprofit textbook reviewer and ideologue. It felt absolutely ridiculous. So ridiculous, in fact, that once I returned home and kind of got my bearings, I had to ask Dan if what Neil was saying was actually true. There's just no way that's real, right? Oh, yeah, it's the pilgrimage to Longview. Dan immediately knew what I was talking about. So they would bring passages and they'd uh, run them by the Gablers or, or by Neil. Are you OK with this? Do you have any objections to it? Do we need to make any changes so that you don't have objections to it? I can tell you they never did that with the Texas Freedom Network, <laughs> but they sure did with the Gablers. Now, we at TFN did meet with publishers, but that was on our request. So publishers would willingly make the pilgrimage to Longview, but wouldn't sit down with other activists like Texas Freedom Network unless provoked. This was a known and accepted part of the textbook publishing industry. One of the most common questions publishers would pose to Neil during these trips was something we'd been wondering ourselves. How are you finding all of these errors? And then I said, if I, if I promise to tell you the truth, you promise to believe me? Yeah. I pray about it, and the Holy Spirit shows me the errors. And you could tell them, looks like they did none of them believe the word of that. Uh, but it's, it's true. Neil prays, and the Holy Spirit shows him the errors not exactly a replicable process. When I spoke to Jim Gabler about his parents, he said they saw their work as a ministry. And I see how that connects to Neil's approach. Whether they're divinely inspired or not, the fact that Neil keeps finding these errors is what's, against all odds, kept him a figure of authority in the field. 
and Neil's really proud of that. Well, why should people take our word over theirs? They're the professionals. Our answer is because we found 25, 30, 35 factual errors to the book that you missed. So that proves they read the book better than you did, and they should take our word rather than theirs. There's no answer to that. You, you want to think, either you didn't read the book or you're ignorant. Take your pick. Because we know, and to tell the truth, say, to tell the truth, yes, I know the subject better than they do. I really do. These people are public school educated. And the editor, the question is, do editors do this on purpose? Or are they, are they, have they, are they miseducated? Uh, and much of the time is they're miseducated. They don't know the other side. The other side Neil is referring to are the histories and sources he's found persuasive over the years. The walls of Neil's office were covered in thick anthologies like Americana Encyclopedia, Britannica, World Books, all of them brown, just like the wood paneling, with light gold lettering. They were all in a perfect row, except for one, which was oddly sideways. Neil said a lot of these books predate the Civil War. Based on the looks of it and the relative age of some of the other items in the room, I believe it. These books are also where he's getting a lot of his information. So Neil's lens for finding errors is based on divine inspiration, 100-year-old sources, and of course, his conservative Christian morality. As a reminder, he's the one who made it so that health books in the early aughts had to say man and woman instead of married partners. On the Christian morality front, Neil's not all that different from the Gablers, but the way he talks about these issues is a lot more fire and brimstone. Texas should not have to pay for moral depravity with public funds. That's moral depravity. Uh, if they're going to try to change students' lifestyles, uh, pr- pressure them to into, into shutting them up if they're opposed to LGBT stuff because they're... Because they're That's they're a homophobic like, rant Neil went on in front of me and my producer, Sarah. Pretty unprompted, too, I might add. I'm not going to play the whole thing because it's cruel and doesn't reflect the ethics of our network. However, this tirade illuminated the ideology behind Neil's work, because when I pushed Neil on his view, he gave an interesting answer. But to be fair, that's your view of moral depravity, right? Someone could no, have a it's different... it's not my view. It's biblical. And if someone doesn't live by the Christian Bible... Well, they're, they're entitled to their beliefs, but not, they, but, not, but not to generate them with public funds. The first thing that jumped out to me was referring to the Bible as a sort of neutral source of information. It's not my point of view. It's the Bible's. As if the Bible is a sort of objective historical document, and not, in fact, a religious text. Mel and Norma did this a lot, too. Joan chronicled it in her book, how often they'd identify errors and provide the Holy Bible as their source for the fact check. Of course, educational research analysts aren't the only folks suggesting the Bible is a neutral guide to public life. That idea is actually a foundational element of the religious and political ideology of something called Christian nationalism. I want to introduce you now to David Brockman, He's the non-resident scholar at Rice University's Baker Institute for Religion and Public Policy. David has written extensively about the rise of Christian nationalism in America. Christian nationalism holds that the the founders, the, the persons responsible for the Declaration of Independence and the U.S. Constitution, intended for the United States to be an explicitly Christian nation governed by Bible-based laws. Christian nationalism used to be more of a fringe faction of the GOP. Recently, in American politics, it's a lot more prevalent. But it's often presented in veiled language. The Christian nationalist agenda has been pushed without explicitly talking about the the Bible or Christianity or these, uh, say, religious exemptions are couched as protecting religion or sincerely held belief, but really many of these laws are coming from Christian conservatives who are attempting to push their particular beliefs on the rest of the population. If that sounds familiar, that's because it's the exact playbook for the Gablers, Neil, and many other people you'll meet in this show. 
Another important element of Christian nationalism is the idea that America has strayed from its original biblical founding. There's a kind of uh, story, a narrative of decline. The, the nation started out as an explicitly Judeo-Christian nation um, governed by Bible-based laws and policies and so forth, and that we've drifted away from that over the years, particularly in the 20th century and particularly since uh, the 1940s. Which means Christian nationalists also have to address who is responsible for this decline. The Gablers suspected communists. And it's very possible Neil agrees with that, too. But when we talked to him, he put forward another culprit. When it comes to changing students' values and behavior standards behind their parents' back. Why do you feel it's behind their parents' back? Because many times students are told not to tell your parents we're doing this. They're told to keep their parents in the dark because they know what will happen if the parents find out. It's deliberately deliberately perverting them on the sly with their parents left in the dark. They know what they're doing. Who's the they in that they sentence? They is, is, is teachers, the, the, the teachers, a lot, not just librarians, but including librarians, are, uh, those, and, and teachers who come out of, out of education schools who are, who are, are taught to, 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 to socialize children away from their parents' values, what they're taught at home, and many times what they're taught at home. It's, it's very diabolical. It's not, it's not accidental. Teachers. The demonization of teachers feels like a departure from the Gablers. I certainly didn't see this coming from Neil. And yet here he is, accusing them of what he called a satanic agenda. And as I'm watching this hate pour out of Neil's mouth, I'm also realizing just how disheveled everything around me is. When we walked into educational research analysts, it was evidently in decay. There are whole rooms that clearly haven't been used in years. Lots of empty shelves, random books left in corners. It certainly didn't look like the hub of productivity I'd read about. Looking at Neil sitting so low in his chair that his sternum barely cleared the desk, I could sense that educational research analysts was on its last leg. I'm having to sell off assets to keep us going here. And uh, I've probably got enough uh, to keep us going maybe three or four more years at the most. My prayer is this, Lord, unlike men, you do not waste resources. Are you sure you squeeze the last drop of your investment out of, out of education research? I think he's saying no, keep those newsletters coming. And I also say, Lord, you know, I can't do it myself. I must have Judy, I can't do it myself. Neil admitted he'd lost a lot of steam in the past few years. He claimed he was as mentally sharp as ever, but that physically he was slowing. My youngest daughter and husband, uh, they've offered to take us into their homes if and when we ever reach our dotage. So we don't have to worry about a nursing home. God forbid we should ever have to take them up on it. This was the last thing I expected from this visit. Seeing Neil choke up while contemplating him and Judy aging and moving in with their daughter. It dawned on me that Neil might be seeing this chapter of his life closing and thinking of this as one of the last, if not the last, interviews he ever gives. It makes sense why he told us so much stuff he'd never admitted before, like claiming he was the man behind the Gabler's success all along, or why he'd so quickly turned emotional when trying to accept that what he believes is God's calling for him is coming to an end. Even though he'd said some pretty heinous things that afternoon, I felt for him in that moment when he teared up. But he quickly got himself together and returned to his faith in God. God would keep him going if he were meant to keep going. My life, including this job, has been a series of implausible improbabilities. Education and research analyst is, is too implausible an organization to exist unless God were in it. It's worth repeating what Neil just said because I couldn't help but smile the first time I heard it. Educational research analysts is too implausible an organization to exist unless God were in it. I don't know if I believe that God had a hand in creating educational research analysts, but I can agree that it's about as implausible of an organization as I can imagine. As we closed, I asked Neil if he had any regrets 
anything he wished he'd accomplished. His answer? Evolution. He wanted textbooks in Texas to use a two-model approach, meaning both creationism and evolution in textbooks. The courts said no, so Neil had a solution. Hey, look, guys, we can't have a two-model approach. Uh, but what we can have is, is discussion of naturalistic strengths and weaknesses in evolution, which do not imply scientific creationism, intelligent design, or young earth. Except... Neil could never get his fellow anti-evolutionists to stick to the script. They always brought arguments back to creationism. And Neil never felt like they executed their arguments strategically enough. I took a leap and asked Neil about someone in particular I thought he might be referring to. Don McElroy? Would he be someone who's struggled to make the argument from the perspective you are saying now? Yeah, I think so. I think so. Don Tart's in the right place. Uh, it, don't repeat this. Uh, but he, he, he is not politically sagacious. He can't see the political implications of this stuff. I gave Neil a knowing smile and motioned that we should probably get back on the road. Neil didn't know this, but our next stop was Bryan, Texas, to sit down with Don McElroy himself. Well, thank you. Thank for you. sharing so much with us today. Sure. I really appreciate it. And for all these resources as well. Yes, this, this is great. really, really You're helpful. Welcome. And it is okay if I, I'm going to walk out of here with a big, big yeah, old stack all, of paper. All, all, all Sarah and I thanked Judy right. and Neil for their time. Judy, remember, had been sitting in the room with us silently the entire time. We peeled ourselves off of our seats. Neil somehow never broke a sweat. Judy, however, seemed desperate to go to a room with more fans. We slowly cobbled together the massive pile of news clippings and resource sheets that they'd kindly printed out for us and made our way back down the orange and brown hallway. Their son still didn't turn his head. Come on. All righty. Well, sir, it was really lovely to meet you. Thank you so much. I've told you two some things I've never said in an interview. Well, I appreciate you telling it to us. Do we get to... Hear it sometime? Oh, we can send it to you for sure. The door closed behind us, and we descended back down the steps and into our rental car, cranked the AC, and exhaled. We pulled back onto the road and headed southwest to meet the notorious evolution skeptic, Don McElroy. Guess how many explanations they have to explain the evolution, how that happened. Zero! They have no evidence. Next week on Teaching Texas the creationist dentist who helmed the conservative Christian majority on the State Board of Education. Teaching Texas is a Wonder Media Network production. To get episodes early, make sure to subscribe to WMN Politics Plus on Apple Podcasts. If you can, please rate and review the show or share it with a friend to help our audience grow. Teaching Texas is created by me, Grace Lynch. It's produced by myself and Adesua Agbenile. Our editor is Lindsay Cradwell. Production assistance by Sarah Schleed. Jenny Kaplan is our executive producer. Original theme music by Chelsea Daniel.